I'm Don Ennis. Welcome to the crossroads of the world, Times Square. If Disney was worse than it is, it would be Times Square. You know, the other day it seemed like Vulcan, and now it seems like we're a Pente. It's freaking freezing today. But let me introduce my BFF, my best friend, my Star Trek partner, my lesbian trans friend, my trans being friend, Melody. Maya Monet! Yay, that's me, Maya Monet. But you and I are old enough, Don, to remember a time when um, Times Square resembled more like Risa than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Maya, I'm, I'm outside Param Paramount Headquarters, Viacom building, where right across the street, there is supposed to be a big Starship Enterprise, but only at 8 p.m. Eastern time. It is Tuesday night as we uh, record this, and uh, I got here too late. I thought I repeated, it doesn't repeat. So here's a video that shows the Enterprise flying in as you would have seen if you were here with me at eight o'clock on Tuesday night, if I were here at eight o'clock on Tuesday night. Maya, I'm in Times Square. Where are you in the world? I am sitting at my dining room table in Orlando, Florida. And a lovely dining room table it is. Thank you, thank you. So any minute now, we're expecting Terry Metalis the showrunner, executive producer of Star Trek Picard to join us here on the Zoom live from Paramount, Los Angeles, probably his home actually. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I doubt very much he's at work on a Tuesday evening, but we're expecting him to join us to talk a little bit, answer some questions. But until then, so stay tuned. Until then, let's do a quick recap. I started off last time. Maya, over to you. Tell us what we saw in episode 10 the last generation. Oh gosh, a lot of things. <laughs> so many Easter eggs, so many emotional moments. Um, it was like watching the second half of a movie. Uh, I think episodes nine and 10, if you put them together, are essentially, I think, the, the last Star Trek Next Generation movie. Um, incredible from beginning to end. I loved all of the Easter eggs but I especially love the lines, the comedy lines. And we'll go through some of those. The plot is this. We're on the Enterprise D and we're on the Titan and we're trying to find a way to rescue Jack from the Borg and to stop the assimilated young crew people who have taken over the fleet. So Maya, pick it up from there. Right, and so when we open up, we actually get a little voice cameo from an original series cast member, right? We get a we get a little bit of, well, it's supposed to be Chekhov's son, right? Antov right. Chekhov. Right, Walter is, Koenig. Walter Koenig, right. And of course, by calling him Anton Chekhov, they're they're actually, you know, um honoring Anton Yelchin, who played Chekhov in the in in the Kelvin universe Star Treks and who sadly passed away. But I mean, I thought that was a very nice touch. I loved hearing his voice. And it's also another callback. Terry is famous for these. This is a callback to Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, in which the Federation president sends a message, save yourselves, stay away from Earth. Right. The whale thing is coming. That's right. <laughs> and it's actually a similar thing in that there's a overwhelming signal, right? And in, in Star Trek IV, that's exactly what's happening as well. This overwhelming signal, look, searching for whales. Um, there's also a nice little, I don't know if you notice, there's a moment where we see like a nebula that was exactly the beginning to Star Trek's uh, The Next Generation credits. So opening credits, at least. And yes. I was like, oh, look at that. <laughs> I saw the blue thing, like a, like a crab kind of thing. Right. And, and the music. And oh, oh wait, even before that, yeah. even before that, the opening logo is the Enterprise D and then the Star Trek Delta gets borgified right yeah I, I love that and you also see little shots of the board cube really quickly as the rainbows zip by so yeah that it's the enterprise d is actually really special all right so here we are we've got uh, the titan crew trying to figure out what do we do we have to fight and they're fighting through the hallways and they're shooting the young borg with stun guns and phasers and whatever and they come to the bridge and they do something that I've never seen before in Star Trek. I think it was Rafi who came up with it. Rafi and Rafi and uh, Seven and the 
three people that they've recruited who aren't 25. <laughs> they come up with a, a phaser rifle that automatically, what did you call it? it I don't know. It's like a phaser transporter hybrid thing that they yeah. put together. I think, I think it was a, a, a transport and go or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't it, know. That's also from a Star Trek movie. The one with the um gosh, which one is I can't remember. It's the one where, where they go to the they, they get young again. I don't know. They they what happened? Say again what? The one with F. Murray oh, Abraham. Insurrection. Insurrection, right. right. There's yes. a scene where they actually um they 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 go down to the planet and they shoot them with those little transport in yes. things yeah. and and uh transport darts to so that they can uh, track them down or, or locate them and then beam them up. So there, there was actually a little bit of that in there. The Sona, the Sona the had, Sona, a, a, yeah, a, exactly. had a device that would beam people up by tagging them. Yeah, that was very cool. Yeah. Excellent point, Maya, I missed that. Thank um, you. But back over on the Enterprise D, we've got a dilemma. They figured out Jack's alive, Jack's on the board ship and the board ship is in the gaseous clouds of Jupiter, which right. we all thought was a nebula, but actually no. And you know, I even thought for a moment it might be Titan. This is the Titan, like Saturn's moon, like in Star Trek uh, Beyond, or is it the other one? One of the Star Trek um, Kelvin years universe. We're movies. failing on the Star Trek references. But yes. Okay, hey, when <laughs> when Han Solo flies the lightsaber. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 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 tell everyone what happens when uh, Picard and uh, the crew on the D, they've realized they've got to take action. Well, they decide to split up and they dis and um, Picard, Riker and Worf, who says he wants to complete the threesome. <laughs> <laughs> do you hear what you're saying, Riker? Do you yes. hear what you're saying? Do you ever listen um, to yourself? Do you listen to yourself? Um, right. and um, Data they, gets pissed. Data's pissed. Data wants to go. And Riker, Riker or Picard is like, no, 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 we need you here. Or, Maybe it was Beverly saying we need you here. Yeah. Well, Beverly says, I would like to tear them for limb from limb as well, but we need you here. And um, so they decide to split up with half the crew remaining on the bridge of the Enterprise, the other half basically storming the board cube because the board cube has lowered their their shields, basically, at, which Picard takes as an invitation for them to get on uh to come on board, you know, or, or actually himself, I guess, as Locutus would be the right, right. The thought. And it's it's something we noticed in the last episode. The Borg cube is not like Borg cubes we've seen before. It's mm -hmm. quiet. It's almost empty. It's disarray. There's they're dying and cannibalized Borg drones. Mm -hmm. And there comes a time when Picard says, "Oh well, you know, it's going to be on the lower level because that's where the thing is." And Riker's like, "How could you possibly know that?" And yeah. I'm thinking. He's Locutus. Of course, he knows that. But it's <laughs> it, it, it's interesting. So yeah. uh, so they're going to go explore. But Picard has a really dramatic moment where he says, "I can no longer be your captain. I must be a father." Mm -hmm. And he sends he sends Worf and Riker off to find that uh, find that the thing beacon that is yeah the beacon that is sending a signal to all the the um, fortified ships. And then back on uh, the Titan. We've got a clever ruse created by Rafi and Seven together. They're sort of like, Pete, I almost think like they're a couple, like they finish each other's sentences. <laughs> yeah, they're on the same page, that's for sure. <laughs> and, and I think it was about um, turning the, uh, the cloaking device into a uh, subterfuge so that they could sneak up on the, uh, the uh, fortified sh uh, Starfleet vessels. They're trying to figure out a way to break out of these, the the Starfleet formation control. And um, Rafi says it works by a kind of line of sight propagation. So they decide to turn on the cloak because that would break them away from being able to control the ship on their own. So that's what they do. And um, that allows them to basically attack the, um, the Starfleet fleet, which has now gathered and is uh, shooting at um, the Starbase. 
Um, and there's also a great scene, my favorite scene is actually with the, the, the crew members that they they actually recruit to help them do this. There's a few that are still not borgified because they're older. And there's the cook who basically gives the, <laughs> the, the, the excuse of, I was out today where they, they were teaching me how to pilot or because my mom was sick. Yeah. <laughs> my mom was sick, my dog ate my homework. Exactly. And, and I'm just a cook, I don't know anything. <laughs> and, and 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 she says, "You're a pilot. You're our pilot." And yeah. a couple of minutes later, the same guy says, "I don't know what his name is." He says, "You know, you want us to attack all of them, the, all, the yeah. whole fleet." The whole fleet. And, and, and Jerry Ryan, at seven and nine, gives a great motivational speech that really gets everybody. She gets off her feet and she says, "We are all that's left. I can't ask you to give your lives for nothing, but I can ask you to fight for uh, the, our families back home, our people." And I just thought that was so well done. So just Captain Seven, you know? <laughs> yeah, that, that scene is really good. It's very powerful emotionally, as is Picard's um, earlier speech also, where he says that, you know, what started 35 years ago ends, ends now. Ends tonight. Yes, yes, ends ends tonight. tonight. Yes. yes, I guess that's night. Um, and it's also interesting to me that when they're all splitting up, Picard, Worf, Riker heading to the turbo lift, and Picard stops and turns. He says, it's been my honor to serve with you all. It's almost like, hey, folks, I'm not coming back. Bye-bye. Yeah, he also he also says his goodbyes to Worf and Riker. So they're they're leading us down this path that this is the last raw for Picard, that, yeah. that he's going to possibly die or pass away. And so there, it's actually, there's also a funny bookend where, <laughs> where when Riker and Worf finally do find the beacon, and um, they get attacked by a couple of Borg that are still functional and they defeat them. Uh, they they go running down the corridor to find Picard and Worf says something along the lines of like, when he woke up this morning, he was worried that they might survive or something. <laughs> I thought we might live, to the, might, might live to see the end of the day. I also like what Worf said to Picard before they parted. Worf says, there are two words that Klingons never say, uh, uh, defeat and farewell. Yes. I love that. That was great. Oh, he's yeah. Michael Dorn. Oh my God. Love there's, it. Yeah, there's a lot of comedy throughout though, as you as you say, you know, there's uh, <laughs> the scene where Worf and his and his uh his blade, which <laughs> apparently is very heavy because Riker can't pick it up. And and there's a phaser in the hilt, which he uses to shoot the two Borg, and and Riker says, Why didn't you just use the phaser? And and Worf says, You can complete that line. Swords are fun. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I did like I did like that it was like a Thor reference that Riker couldn't pick up the sword because it was so heavy. That was right. pretty cool. But then, like you said, they're all reunited, and now Picard is with Jack. Picard and Jack are with the Borg Queen. And mm -hmm. you pointed out to me, this is not the Borg Queen from First Contact, who you know they broke her neck, they chopped her up, they they melted her. This is the Borg Queen that Admiral Janeway from the future defeated with the help of Captain Janeway in the finale of Star Trek Voyager, played right. by Alice, Alice Kreese. Right, that's right. And she looks um, like a lot of the board. She looks desiccated. She looks like she's been half consumed. Um, she looks quite monstrous actually. So um, not the kind of oddly, weirdly sexy Borg queen from <laughs> <laughs> from either Picard season two or um, uh, First Contact. So yeah, she she basically has said that she's consumed everything she could just to stay alive for this moment where she can confront Picard um, again and or at least, you know, exact her final revenge on the Federation and the, for leaving the them and destroying them. But Picard has one trick left up his sleeve. Mm -hmm. he, he thinks she wants him. He offers himself. She doesn't want him. She's not interested. Borg are no longer going to worry about flesh or metal. We are going to evolve. We are going to evolve. We're no longer going to assimilate. We are going to worry about evolution. And Picard realizes the only way to get to Jack is to join him mm -hmm. in the collective. And he unplugs right. Jack and then plugs himself into the collective. And we get a whole bunch of like a montage of Locutus of Borg. Yeah. We get shots from uh, Star Trek First Contact, actually. Um, Best of both worlds and also, yeah, yeah from uh, First Contact, yes. Yeah, and, and also the Borg Queen actually says they're no longer going to assimilate, they're going to annihilate. Which annihilate, is, that's right. Yeah. And so great, that's great, great. 
that's this whole idea that no, they're no longer interested in really assimilating cultures. They're just, they just want to rampage through the universe. I tell you, it was interesting the way they presented the Borg Queen, like, you know, from behind, and we're not going to see her face. They, Terry Metalis, you had me fooled. I swore it was going to be like a Borg hybrid of future Admiral Janeway and Alice Kriege, uh, the Borg Queen from Voyager. I, I'm not disappointed. I'm glad that it wasn't that way, but it, it yeah. was just interesting, the choices they made. And I'm, I'm interested in hearing what Terry has to say about that. What did you think about Deanna coming to the rescue? That was one of my favorite scenes. I got up off my couch and I cheered. Redemption. Right. Well, there's there's two great scenes there, right? There's they're being attacked. You know, the Enterprise D is being attacked by the Borg Cube, right? They're being shot at and everything like that. And then um Beverly has to fire on the board cube and and um, LaForge turns around and tells her that he didn't get a chance to finish the targeting on the weapon system so she's going to basically have to eyeball it and they fly in and she like launches all these torpedoes and phasers and there's a dramatic scene of all these explosions and they all turn around and look at her like where did that come from and she says it's it, a lot has happened in the last 20 years, 20 years. <laughs> it's a great line it's great it's a great line yeah yep, and, yep. Yeah. and then of course what happens is is that um they can't find the the enterprise has at this point penetrated the board cube because they figure out it's at the center of the board cube and data um, asks them to trust his gut because they say that they can't, there's no way they can navigate in there, you know, um, but Data feels like he can do it. And so he does. He flies them in into the board cube because this board cube is enormous. It's much, much, much bigger than any board cube we've ever seen before. So not only that, but I think Data has seen Lando Calrissian pirate, pilot the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> the Millennium Falcon, right? The Return of the Jedi. <laughs> right. It's it's very, it's very Return of the Jedi. Yeah. It is, it is. And and they fly in and they see this big core in the middle, which is also very Return of the Jedi. And um <laughs> they're about to destroy it and they tell Riker and Worf that, you know, once they destroy it, it's tied into all the systems of the Borg cube and the whole entire Borg cube will, oh, that's very New York, but anyway, yeah. the entire <laughs> Borg cube will explode. And so they don't know if they're going to be able to basically rescue them and beam them out alive. And that's when um, Riker and Worf go running after Picard because they need to get them so that they can um, help beam yep. them out because they're in a part of the Borg cube where they can't get a signal on them. There's only a minute left. They said that once they fire those missiles, they'll have a minute. And Riker says, I owe him at least that much to try to save him in that final minute of my life. Right. And 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 Riker says to work, so good friend, old friend, are you ready? And Worf, of course, like tees up the Riker's teeing up the line and Worf <laughs> delivers. Today was a good day to die. Yeah. <laughs> right. But then he, then Riker turns around and basically says, um, Inzadi, um, you know, I'll be waiting, you know, your son and I will be waiting for you basically on the other side. And so that's what Deanna, oh, you're already crying. Okay. That's not <laughs> I, right. I, I, I am literally crying right now. And Just that's thinking in, about that. What a, yeah. what a line. I yeah. am waiting for you with our son. Oh my God. Yes. And so oh. meanwhile, of course, Picard is with his own son inside the the Borg collective consciousness and trying to convince him to come with him. Um, but um, Deanna is able to sense where they are because of the emotional release, I guess, that uh, uh, Riker shows in that moment. So he's, she says, I know where they are. And then a lot of things happen at one time. Picard says that he's going to, if, if, um, his son won't leave, he's going to stay with him. So it's actually very reminiscent of the scene where, um, Data also basically gives himself up to to uh, Lore, you know, and basically says these these are all my memories. So it it remind he actually what he does is surrender surrender to the moment, right? Instead of trying to break him out or convince him that he's wrong, he just says it's okay. I love you. I will stay with you to the end, and um, that's what actually what convinces Jack to break loose of the control of the Borg. And it's interesting. Oh, you want more New York? I've got the, uh, I've got the Daredevil. What's his name? No, not Daredevil. What's his name? Elmo. Deadpool. Deadpool and Elmo back there. Oh. Yeah. See. <laughs> there they are. See. See. Like, Don't get too close. Or they're gonna want some money for for, <laughs> for getting them on camera. <laughs> so I'll tell you that 
what happens next is just incredible. They have a montage. Jack is seeing his life flash before his eyes of the last week <laughs> of right. getting to know his dad, of being with his mom. Um, right. It's interesting they don't flash back to anything before that, but that's okay. I mean, <laughs> it's really about Picard. Right. And Picard said two things. He said, I have fought. I said I would never rejoin the collective, but now I have a reason to. And then he plugs himself in. And then he says, like you said, uh, you're more important to me. You have changed my life. Oh, I'm getting all. You were the, the, the you were the part that was missing, basically. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and it's mm -hmm. it's interesting. Uh, I I had an airplane movie type scene in my head where Laris is at the bar back on Earth, looking at her watch like, um, Picard, are you coming back? I've been I've been I've been waiting. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's it's also a little bookend scene to the scene where Picard is in in the bar and basically says he didn't need anything else. And Jack right. saw him say that and decided that he didn't want a relationship with his father. But now Picard actually admits that, yeah, he's the missing part of him. He's the part of the family that he always wanted. And so that convinces yeah. him to basically break loose, rip off all the Borg Woo! stuff, you know, disconnect Picard. And then right, what, what do we see? We see the Enterprise D swoop in. From, on from, top. from underneath, we're looking up. We're looking up through the hole in the board ship yeah. that's blown up, and 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 we see all the characters looking up, and it's an underneath shot of the D, which is yeah. so incredible. It looks so amazing. I kept looking at the detail like on the D. Yes, yes. You know the the engines look metal. You know it's like whoa, man. They really put a lot of thought into recreating that ship, and and of course then they beam up Picard and. Um, Jack, and then they beam up Riker and Worf, and they fly out. And, and the Borg ship blows up. The Borg just like in Star Wars and Return of the Jedi. Whoops, no, I'm right. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and we get a nice shot of the of the Enterprise exiting the Borg cube with its shields, you know, shielding it from the fire. And of course, we also get the Borg, who are still, um, well, the human Borg, right, hybrids, who are on the ship say, you know, Transmission has been interrupted. Let's follow the last command. And so they, they move on. Meanwhile, the Borgified members of the Titan crew are, are staging um, an assault on the on the bridge crew. And we get this moment where the transporter door opens and right, um, I'm sorry, Seven and, and her crew are pointing their phasers at the Borgified crew. And we get this you know tense moment. And then of course the Borg cube explodes and they turn back to human and say, you know, we don't know what we were doing, that kind of thing. Um, so that, that, that's how it resolves. Although the, the timing of that, yeah, is a little weird because, you know, you would think at the moment the transmitter was destroyed, they would all turn back. Um, but yeah, I, I'll, I'll ask Terry that, but, you know, you've already, I think, provided the answer to that, which is a, it was drama, right? It, it, it increases the drama of the moment. But I'll tell you right now, Seven of Nine in Voyager, yeah. When when the turbo lift doors open and the fortified crew appear on the bridge, even after they went back to normal and their eyes turn normal and their skin turns back to normal, right. she would have said, "Sorry, bing, 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 pew, 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 and stunned them all anyway, <laughs> just just in case." I'm not taking any chances. That seven and nine would have would have shot them all. Um, right. But it, but it was great that um, even though they're not sisters in real life, that. LeVar Burton's daughter, Mika Burton, and uh, the actress, uh, I'm having a mental part that doesn't remember the, her name, but the yeah. one who plays Sydney. Right. Together, they're in a scene where they shoot the um, stolen Klingon bird of prey cloaking device. Right. And I love that because it was them acting together as Borgs, but still sisters. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's that's one of the reasons why, of course, they... The um the Titan gets taken out of the fight when that happens because they no longer have a cloak. Um, so that's when the the darkest moment happens. But of course, then the Enterprise saves the day and everybody's happy and blah blah blah. And you know, yay for our original crew members um from TNG. And um it's 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 a nice ending. I know some people have said, how can they wrap up this storyline in an hour? Well, they they give us like flash forwards and and these kinds of little pieces. Of, of information. Um, so they they mention how Beverly comes up with a way of basically putting every uh, all the young people through the transporters again and removing the um, Borg code. 
as well as detecting the changelings that are still left. Um, that was cool. And, yeah. And so, she's now Admiral of Starfleet Medical now too. She is now Admiral of Starfleet Medical also. There's also this amazing little line that where Riker mentions that the changelings didn't kill anybody that they impersonated because they needed them for information, you know, no matter what level they were at. And then we get a swing around and it's Tuvok, right? Uh, talking to Seven and talking to 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 her about the um, review that um, our late great uh, Captain Shaw left, basically saying that she's a renegade, but also very brave and the rules she's broken probably meant to be broken and that he recommends she be promoted to captain. And she starts to cry because she she had literally just resigned. Uh, Tuvok <laughs> says, I don't accept your resignation. And she is now the captain of the Titan. Yes, and interesting. I thought Todd Stashwick did a great job in that speech. Mm -hmm. According to the lines that Tuvok read, this was recorded prior to the hijack. This was something that he had planned on doing even before he, you know, suspended her or brought her back, whatever else. Right. I, I just, I, I liked how he delivered those lines. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, but, you know, it wraps up a lot of loose ends really quickly <laughs> in the space of about five minutes. Well, remember though, so I checked the, the feed. Maya and I got to watch a commercial free version of uh, part 10, the yeah. last generation. The only problem being our email is spread all across the middle of the screen. So you're like, <laughs> it's very annoying, but I lived with it. For yeah, the yeah, just, I'll, I'll put up with this so I can watch the episode. But yeah. what's interesting is it's an hour and two minutes and 51 seconds mm -hmm. without commercials. Yes. You, you add in all those commercials, it's gotta be 90 minutes. It's gotta be a 90 minute show. Yeah, um, it's it's about sixty-two minute runtime. I think is what what it says on on our displays. That is an hour and two minutes and fifty-one seconds. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I, I'm not disagreeing. We're not fighting. <laughs> oh, never fight about it. No. Hey, listen. So so then as a flash forward, like you had hinted at just a minute ago, it's a year later. Right. A year a year later, and you pick it up from there, Maya. So yeah, we're treated to um, Admiral, as you said, Crusher and Admiral Picard on a shuttle with uh, Jack, who now is a Starfleet ensign and has been put through Starfleet Academy in some accelerated kind of program. Nepo baby. Nepo baby. <laughs> <laughs> but he actually makes mention that maybe it was his name that kind of helped. Um, and then Picard says um, that names don't matter. Um, and also, um, he wanted he wants to know what ship Jack has been assigned to because they don't uh, mention it. And meanwhile, Jack is very nervous. And we come up with this shot that reminds us a lot of the ending of Star Trek: um, The Voyage Home, yeah. right? Where yeah. the where, one with the whales, <laughs> the one with the whales, where they're in space dock and they're and the and the crew is wondering what ship they're going to get, and and somebody wants Excelsior, and 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 and, and Scotty says something like, "Why would you want that bucket of bolts?" and and they come up on this ship that looks like the Excelsior, and then they pass it, and then we see the 1701A, which is this great moment, and so we cut back to, of course. Picard on the shuttle and we see a very similar scene where we see the Titan and Picard says oh of course the Titan but then we kind of come up and crush uh Admiral Crusher and um and her son basically say that they were actually nervous for Picard and not for themselves and and they forgive them they ask him to forgive them the subterfuge but he doesn't like pomp and circumstance and then they kind of go up to the top part of the saucer section and it says NCC 1701G. G, G, the G spot. The That's Enterprise right. with the G spot. Now <laughs> this makes me question, did the Borgified fleet destroy the F, the brand new F? Well, if you look at some of the credits of, you know, all those credits that we've been treated to all throughout that give us little hints for the plot or whatever, there's actually a little bit where it says something about the NCC 1701F being slated for decommissioning. So um, I think this was just a natural evolution. Now, why they chose the Titan to be the G, I don't know. I mean, I guess because of course now it gives us a chance for a Star Trek legacy and they already have the ship built and <laughs> everything like that. But uh, you know, the F is a very impressive large ship um, that looks like a natural evolution of the E, but the 
the G, you know, is supposed to be this Constitution II class ship. So it's actually more reminiscent of the older designs of the Enterprise. And um, Jack has been assigned to the Enterprise, and we get he we get onto the onto the um, onto the bridge, bridge and he pretends like he owns the place and he goes, take us to the Matala sector. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down on the, uh, sits down on the captain chair and then seven of nine tells him to get out. And so we find out it's actually now seven of nine and Rafi and um, Jack. She's his, num she's his, she's her number one. Yes, that's right. Which, you know, as a lesbian, that's, that's about as lesbian a moment as we get. And, you know, as I, as I was telling you earlier, you know, it's sort of like they took a U-Haul, renamed it Enterprise. <laughs> and so now Rafi and Seven are not only living together again, but they're working together again. And who knows what hijinks will ensue and, you know, the, the, the um, difficulties of, of, perhaps, you know, being interested in somebody who's actually lower than you in rank and and who knows what's going to happen. But, you know, it's going to be traditionally uh, complicated as it would really be in the lesbian universe. So, <laughs> so we didn't get, them. yeah, we didn't get a trans character and we didn't get a lesbian scene. No. Are you okay with the fact that at least they're together, even if they're not together in a relationship? Because I guess Starfleet probably would look, well, I mean, Hey, wait a minute. Riker yeah. and Riker and Troy served on the Titan, the original Titan after the Enterprise. They served together and they were married. So maybe if uh, Seven of Nine and Rafi get married, they can still serve together. Who knows? Yeah, well, not only that, I mean, the counselor also, Troy had a relationship with both Worf and Riker at different times on the Enterprise D. True. And so also, cool. don't forget, we also had Seven of Nine with Chakotay, which I don't know, go figure that. And yeah. And, and here's the thing, I'm sorry that they didn't hold hands or give a kiss or say something, but there's, it's what Anton Chekhov said, the president of the Federation, I believe there are always possibilities. That's right. <laughs> and we here's, here's the cliffhanger. I know this pissed you off, but I loved it. The cliffhanger with Captain Seven on the bridge. That's it's right. It's time to say that phrase. Right, and they make a big deal of it. Rafi says like, hey, this is your first command. You know, are you gonna say engage? You know, make it so, what are you gonna say? <laughs> and and also uh, Jack, who's now also been assigned to the bridge, basically as a consultant to the captain, that's gonna be his official position. You know, also says, yeah, this is like basically your, your phrase for, you know, posterity. What are you gonna say? And we get a, a shot of seven of the nine going, and then the next thing you know, you have a cut to the outside of the ship and the ship goes into warp on its shakedown cruise, right? But, uh, you know, I do wonder though, an hour has, has, I mean, an hour, a year has transpired between the end of, of the battle with the Borg and this scene. So, you know, I have hope that Rafi and Seven have somehow settled their relationship or maybe gotten back together or whatever. But yeah, you're right. We don't get a, a, a lesbian relationship resolution, except that there are, as you say, always possibilities, which is also, of course, an, a line from another Star Trek movie. Um, and, you know, I, I, am I am I satisfied? I, I really wish there had been a moment where they touched hands or, or even in a firefight where they had had kissed, you know, because of the drama of the moment, they they don't know if they're going to be going to live beyond you know today. That would have been nice. I think I think they could have thrown that in and not really interrupted the flow of the show. Um, but um, I am having my fingers and toes crossed that we get a sequel show, a spinoff. We get Star Trek Legacy, and that in there, I'm sure they're going to handle. You know, or they're going to have to deal with the relationship issues. I mean, at they, some they, point, yeah. yeah, they they have to um, they have to deal with it. So, you know, at least they're together. Um, they're not separated as they were through most of the series, and you know, they they work well together. I mean, they took over the Titan together. They they um, battled all of Starfleet <laughs> at once together. You know, uh, and. Starfleet saw fit to assign them to the same ship together. So, you know, let's see what happens. And and Rafi's still a commander, which, you know, she's been for on and off the last couple of seasons, but that's yeah. okay. I, as long as she's serving with uh, Seven, I feel good. Um, so let's segue as we're sort of already in that department now. Mm -hmm. Our wish, our wishes unfulfilled, our, 
are things that we wanted to see. Mine was, I thought for sure that Seven was going to use Borg nanites or nanoprobes or whatever it is in her fingers and bring Shaw back to life. It was nice seeing him in the video clip that Tuvok presented, but I really wanted to see Shaw come back and say, what the fuck did you do to me, bitch? <laughs> Unlike Star Trek, this Star Trek had an end credits or mid credit scene. And mm -hmm. were you surprised? Because I was. Um, I wasn't because I pay attention to Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> what? Twitter, what's that? Is that what the kids are kids are doing these days? <laughs> somebody somebody had mentioned that there was a mid credit scene, so I stuck around. But yeah, it, it is a surprising scene, I'll tell you that. But you know, it feels very Marvel like and that they threw it in there. But I mean, I really, really, I, I really appreciated it. Let's put it that way. Having spoken to John Delancey when he did season two, I love seeing him back. And I love the idea that now he's gonna go after Jack the way he went after Picard and mm -hmm. Janeway and Cisco. I'm really grateful that they offered that extra credits thing because I think what happens too often is people don't really read the credits. I watch a lot of these Star Trek Picard review shows and most of the guys I, I listen to, they're like, yeah, I don't watch the credits. I don't know who, I, w I wonder if that was Alice Krieg from the, the Borg uh, movie, uh, First Contact. I'm like, yeah, it's in the credits. I mean, I guess people just don't watch the credits anymore. Um, yeah, I've been watching the credits for this show very, very closely because they're they're a work of art, actually. I mean, you know, the way they're they, creative, very creative. They've also put in little clues for future episodes, you know, and it's very satisfying to get that last piece, you know, of what that little design with the the things, you know, throwing, you know, flowing at each other. What is that? You know, which gets we finally added. found out in, in episode nine that yeah, we, accordion looking thing was a transmitter. That's right. That's right. And if you look closely, it'll say like uh, transmitting protein, receptor protein, you know, it actually has little detail in it. And of course, you know, listing out the, the different ships and in, in, at the fleet museum, you know, all that stuff. I've been like pausing and watching and pausing and, and it, everything gave you a little hint. And so to have also the credits be completely different in episode 10, where basically we just have a pull away and we get a shot of the Enterprise crew playing poker. So it's it's a heartwarming moment. You can tell that these characters or these actors really love each other and they're very comfortable with each other. It's it's it feels very unscripted. They ask Picard to um make a toast. And so I looked up the quote. He 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 it's actually a quote from Julius Caesar by William Shakespeare. Of course, Shakespeare. I know. I knew it was Shakespeare. I just didn't know the, the source. Go ahead. Yeah, I looked it up and it's and it's basically about, you know, taking the time to to jump into adventures, you know, um, instead of instead of not taking chances, you know, that kind of thing. It's it's basically the gist of it. And, you know, how you, they've ridden together in, on the sea, you know, and 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 basically on these ventures. Um, which was a, a very nice ending, uh, you know, it, as they're seated together in 10 forward and, and discussing what, what their next plans are, you know, apparently Riker and Deanna are going to Orlando. <laughs> yes, and, and, and what a call, we should ask Terry about that, but also there's a shout out to Whoopi, to Guinan. Yes, yes, that Guinan has been giving them side eye the whole time because right. they shut down the yeah. bar. <laughs> right, and I, I love the fact they also gave a, a shout out to Wesley. Uh, even though he's not in the show, um, mm -hmm. if you watch The Ready Room, it's a very emotional uh, episode uh, that's currently streaming in which Will Wheaton visits the Enterprise D bridge. And it's incredible watching him, like all of us, geek out. And he's with Michael Okuda, the designer of the L cars uh, from Star Trek The Next Generation. So yeah. it's just wonderful. And he also then he visits with uh, Jonathan Frakes as well, who he calls Johnny. Everybody seems to call Frakes Johnny, which is amazing. Yeah. I, I just, I love, I love the family that Terry brought back together because I feel like for all of us who don't necessarily have a family, you know, I lost my family by coming out. The Enterprise D is my family. They're my family I turn to when I need inspiration, when I need to feel loved, to feel encouraged, challenged, to know that there are always possibilities. Yeah. When 
Next Generation came out in 1987. I was 16. And I was living a, a very closeted life on Long Island. And being able to uh, join in these adventures was certainly an emotional outlet for me. And as a, as a trans woman, as a queer woman, it, it spoke to me in ways that other shows didn't at the time. And, and it also, you know, gave me possibilities. You know, there was an episode where they actually dealt with, uh, in a way, trans people. You know, there was a, an episode where they dealt with uh, somebody transitioning and what that meant for love. And, and you know, the, there's, there's quite a lot of, of things that as a young person who really didn't even acknowledge being trans that I could really connect with and, and found relatable and was always supportive. I found Star Trek when I was 12 years old. I was in my school, my Catholic school, and a young woman, Jennifer Judge, who, you know, wasn't one of my friends, she was just somebody in the class, said, Star Trek? Oh, I hate that show. And I wasn't exactly very fond of Jennifer. So I thought, well, if she hates it, I bet I'll like it. <laughs> and and um, I had I mean, heard of Star Trek. I had heard of Star Trek because I grew up in the 60s and Lost in Space and Batman were on. So I'm not going to watch Star Trek. I watched Lost in Space. I watched Batman. But when the 70s, WPIX, 11 Alive, started rerunning them, that's when I found it. And I found it at 12 years old. And I've been a Trekkie ever since. Yeah. And, and when I was a kid, even younger than 16, when I was still living in Queens, uh, which would have been when I was like single digits in age. I, one, one Christmas, my mom gave me the little bridge set from the <laughs> series that has yes, a little play school, yeah. that you basically like twisted, you know? Spin around. Yes, yeah. I remember. I and, had it. Yeah. And I had, and there were like two other little boxes and um, I was a very bad kid. And <laughs> I wasn't usually bad, but I scratched the 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 front of it and I looked in and I saw the face of Spock so my mom oh. had me the Spock doll and a actually a Captain Kirk doll as well and she got very angry when she pulled that toy out at Christmas and realized I had broken into it <laughs> I had no regrets <laughs> I recently found my tricorder cassette player so it's mm -hmm. a real cassette player but it looks like a tricorder from the 60s TV show yeah and I of course had painted over part of it with like model paint because <sighs> I was some stupid kid you know idiot I had a uh, I had uh, walkie talkies that were like the communicators yep I had those two yep I had I had a, a, a game a, a, a shoot 'em up game uh, I still have that and I have a uh, uh, what was it the um, the thing you mentioned the spinning transporter bridge thing yeah yes oh memories we would we would be able to retire and never have to work again if we still had those in mint condition. <laughs> Inside the box, unopened. Inside yes. the box, yes. <laughs> yes. Terry Metalis just said, okay, coming. All right. Yes. Speaking of who? Terry Metalis, welcome to Dawn and Maya Review, Star Trek Picard, The Last Generation. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Hi. Hi, Terry. I've had the great pleasure of talking to you before, and we chat sometimes on yes. Twitter. But may I please introduce you to my BFF, yeah. Melody Maya Monet, live. Hello, Melody Maya Monet. Hi. Orlando. She's in Orlando, and we're recording this on Tuesday night. And Terry, we've got a lot of things to say, but I got to say it first before I give Maya the mic to say, ask her questions. Congratulations. You knocked it out of the park, sir. It oh. was amazing thank you i'm so glad you guys liked it it was see where, incredible see where i am see where i am I'm at, are I'm you at, waiting for are you waiting for the enterprise uh i've been waiting since after eight i missed it apparently it only oh. happens once it only happens once at eight and that's it and i've been standing here there it is it's up there and uh i am so jealous i so wanted to fly out to see it but I, I'm, oh, me I'm too. stuck in la i know i wanted you to see it too I might come back, but at least I went to the Viacom Paramount building so I could at least talk to you <laughs> and my friend Maya. So, so Maya, take it away. What's your first question for Terry Metalis, showrunner, executive producer, writer, director of Star Trek Picard? Well, I'm going to, I think, ask the most consequential question of this entire series, which is why would Riker and Troy even think about going to Orlando? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> well, we like to think... We like to think that in the 25th century, it's been, uh, Florida's a, a better place. 
Well, as, as somebody who lives in Florida and in Orlando particularly, <laughs> I was absolutely- we, we, we made that joke in the writer's room quite a bit, that, uh, right. that maybe uh, we like to think that, uh, we like to think positively that they turned it around. That's right. Well, I want to thank you for at least a shout out, even if it was, you know, somewhat ironically funny, but, uh, you know, it, it was, um, I would, I was telling, um, uh, Don that I think if you took episodes nine and 10 and basically smushed them together, we got the last Star Trek movie that we all, that loved. was, that was the, that was the intent. And I, and I think for the IMAX people who are lucky to get in to see it as, and as in the IMAX version that they'll, they'll get that experience. That was that was the goal. And there were so many Easter eggs and so many bookends to things that happened in previous Star Treks. Um, I think the folks at Screen Ranch who do that video that break down Easter eggs are probably going to Screen lose their crash, minds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah is the best. But I mean, I, I have to say, I, I do have one question though. I've always wanted to ask someone who runs a Star Trek show is that when you're handed over the, the keys to a show like this, do they give you a Star Trek Bible to like, these are the things that have happened. These are the things you need to follow up on in terms of continuity. Uh, no, no. Terry, you could have written one. <laughs> no, it's, it, it, no, um, no, it's up to us to, to, we have a franchise department that we, we connect with. It's up to us to do our own research and go back to the episodes as best we can and watch so um, very often um, we'll talk about it that and uh, a specific thing and be like, we got to go watch it that night. And right. so we'll have spent maybe 13 hours in the room, go home, uh, you know, very often. Uh, I like to say that this year took uh, 35 years off my life and gave <laughs> and added 35 pounds uh, because we, we would eat dinner at 11 o'clock at night watching Next Gen trying to, or Deep Space Nine and making sure that we were, you know, uh, you know, Odo's bucket was quite, was quite a bit of a, of a thing, but we, we felt like it made enough sense that a changeling would need to recharge in a bucket. And, but, uh, yeah, but again, it's like things like that we watch, you know, we, right. we have to do our own, our own research. So you did an amazing amount of research. I mean, right from the, right from the start of this particular episode with the, with the recreation of the nebula from the opening credits of Star Trek: The Next Generation. Um, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that wasn't a recreation. That's an actual footage, and then we upraised it as best we could. Oh wow! Oh, wow. Yeah. Didn't know that. It looks yeah. exactly like the same, so it's perfect. That, yeah, it was the same. And then the idea was that we we tried to match the the color scheme, so it was almost as if the Enterprise was was in that in that scheme. Yeah. Speaking of right. Enterprise, I've got to ask this question. I read that. As the showrunner, executive producer, you're on a very tight timetable. And these people have become your friends, these heroes. So you want to have them play a little bit on the beautiful, amazing set that is just so perfect. But you have to basically say, OK, folks, got to get to work. Let's go. Let's go. What was that like for you, Terry? Uh, it was really hard. <laughs> it, it's really hard because um, we only had two days on that set. It was it was a very very ambitious schedule. It's, it, we're essentially making a movie on a television uh, timetable, uh, and so we had we had two days um, and, and and a lot to pack on. So um, all the stories about that cast when you call cut are true. They immediately burst into song. They immediately, immediately make jokes. They start dancing. They do all the things, um, <clears throat> and you want to hang out and do that. Um, and so, but you, you can't, you're like, guys, we got, come on, we gotta go. Stop. Stop. We gotta go. Um, uh, the only time that, uh, that I built that in was, um, at the very end in the poker game. Um, I really, uh, I really wanted to get a sense of, of 
for the audience to have a little wish fulfillment so that they could feel like they were at that poker game with them. Um, and so what I did was I, I actually rolled camera for 45 minutes and just let them play their own poker game. Uh, and really? Just let, let the it's camera, a real poker game. It's a real it's poker a real, game. They just, they just played. And so that I could get them being them and let them have real natural laughs. And so all those smiles are genuine so that the audience could feel like what it's like being at that table with Patrick and Jonathan and Marina and Gates and Michael Labar and, and, and everybody. So, and Brent. And so I think probably on the Blu-ray we'll release a longer version of, of all that, that, that improv. Um, Cause that I, I, I wanted, we never got to really sit at that table with them. And so that was, that was the, the, the sense of all that, that I really, the, so that's the, that's the only time I built that into the, the thing. What I really love about that scene is how it all, court, of course, bookends, um, you know, all good things where, where uh, Picard walks in and he sits down and finally yeah. invites himself to the poker table. And, but there's a moment of pathos there, right? Where he says, I should have done this a long time ago. Um, and then of course, in Nemesis, we have a little more pathos because uh, Data has died, but now we just have unabashed joy, right? This is yeah. the ending we really wanted. We wanted them to be happy. And yeah. you can you get the sense that they really are happy and that they have bright futures ahead of them, even if they've gone through all these things together and that they're going to be friends forever. Yeah, for me, that's kind of the surprise ending. Um, I, I kind of I wanted to make everybody feel like someone's probably going to die. Right. I wanted that tension to be permeated throughout the, the 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 movie, essentially. That's why there's a lot of moments where a card says goodbye to Riker on the cube. Uh, there's a sense that Worf and Riker aren't going to make it out. There's moments with Deanna and Riker where it's like, this could be it for them. Um, the kind of moments- Yeah, you that, fooled me. You the fooled kind of me. moments and finales <laughs> that you only do when somebody's going to go. Oh, yeah. Um, and <clears throat> it's for the drama and, and it feels earned because you prob they probably believe that in that moment. Like they need to say those things. You know, it's an honor serving with you all is another one of those moments. Um, uh, but I don't have it in me to say goodbye to those people in that way. Um, so uh, I always knew it, it it had to you know, to be that. And you know, look, there's going to be those lazy, angry critics who are going to say it's fan service, nostalgia bait, member berry shit. But you know, <laughs> well, I, I actually went to the premiere of Star Trek: First Contact in Hollywood. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, back in the day. Um, it was an amazing moment. I didn't expect to do that. I'd been, I was in town. I happened to be in town for something else entirely. And I found out that um, Patrick Stewart had given tickets to Amnesty International to, as a fundraiser. So me and my then wife, we bought tickets and we went and we saw it at the, at the Man's Chinese Theater. And we actually also attended the after party. So having actually walked amongst them, you know, and actually a lot of members of the DS9 crew were there as well as Voyager. And, you know, it's an amazing thing to be around these people when they're not on camera, you know, and, and see them interact and, and to get a moment like that for the fans, you know, in the show itself was, I think, an amazing thing. You can tell that it was, that it felt unscripted. It felt very much just like off the cuff. And it was, and it's also very funny. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad it played. Yeah. Let me let me ask you about uh, my friend Pat, who calls me Dawn. 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 Um, Sir Patrick Stewart, what a performance! What was it like directing this legend and having these lines? What started thirty five years ago ends tonight, and the thing I miss the most is the carpet. I mean, <laughs> from from pathos to comedy. He does it all. And he, he got me crying when he hugged Jack and he joined the collective. And he said, the thing I said I would never do, I have a reason to do now. And it's just such a performance. I mean, he, he gave it all. <clears throat> you know, he didn't leave anything on the table. He does, you know, and he's unbelievably collaborative in that way. He doesn't, he definitely doesn't want to feel like as a performer, he's shortchanging his performance in any way. Um, and so, um, yeah, it, it, it's, I'll, I'll say as a director, it is daunting to give him Patrick, Sir Patrick Stewart a note. Uh, so you're approaching him and, and you're like, right, here we go. You know, uh, and, and he, and he listens 
And then he's like, okay. And then you see what he's going to do. One, you know, and then he, and he's always, we'll give you something very surprising too. A, a case in point was um, uh, when he says goodbye to Riker on the queue, he put, he put it, he, he went to a place that we weren't prepared for when he, when he starts to get choked up. And even Frakes was like, we were all floored by the time we yelled cut. We were all like, what are we going to do now? We were all, we were all in tears. So, uh, you know, so it's all, it's all every, honestly, but that's the case with all of them. Honestly, they've all never been better. They're all at the top of their game. You know, uh, Frakes, Michael Lamar, Dorn, Frakes, Lamar. Brent, Brent is oh. phenomenal. Is, is, you know, is brings this new level of data that uh, uh, I, I I wish we had ten more episodes to see. You know, yeah. and Lavar, yeah. Cher, Gates, Marina. They're you know, it's Jerry is phenomenal. You know, yes. Bobby, they're, Jack, they're, they're, yeah. Jack. I mean, we we don't even talk about how wonderful Jack is. Ed Spillier is amazing. Moment. I mean, it, it, the Jack Car uh, Ed carried this this season on his shoulders. Todd, um, just the charisma that Todd that Todd was able to to Ashley as as Sydney and and uh, you know um, everyone's been been so Mika is so charming as 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 as, as Jordy's sister. We've just been been. Um, just blessed with this cast in in every way uh it's it's been phenomenal terry tell us about that last scene on the titan which is now the enterprise g where we <laughs> have a queer captain seven and a queer rafi as her first officer number one that was our goal from the beginning we knew very much from the, be the beginning of the season that that was our north star that we wanted Rafi and Seven to be captain and first officer of the Enterprise. Um, we also knew that it was gonna be tricky with their relationship uh, with Starfleet regulations and all that uh, um, to get them there. Um, but we always knew that was the image at the end was Rafi and Seven together. And if we can earn that moment, um, that would be really satisfying. I think Maya wants to ask a question about the future. You know, Maya is our resident trans lesbian. Relationship wise between Rafi and Seven? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, is there hope for them in the future? Technically, Starfleet regulations are not in the favor of a captain. And, but that didn't really stop Kirk and Spock, did it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. God knows, oh. <laughs> God knows wow. the, sexual, the sexual tension was high there. I think how great would it be to explore that in a series? You know, how how great would it be to to it's it's clear Rafi and Seven love each other. And that was, you know, with Seven and and I mean with Jerry and, and Michelle, we always, you know, we always talked about that we knew where we were going and that this was the moment and that they were always family and that they loved each other and that we would get here. Um, but the chance to really explore that in series about what that would mean for each other to send each other on missions and to have those the, the real um the real conflicts of interest becomes really interesting so you had queer writers in the room too right oh yeah yes yes yeah. and it's in in and 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 the argument was it's way sexier now <laughs> <laughs> i mean as a lesbian and a transgender woman you know i really wasn't all that bothered by the fact that i mean there wasn't this wasn't a sexy season you know in any way it, and it was no right it, it, sadly it was not for anyone <laughs> right but, then, but that's okay i have i have an idea of the way you can pitch star trek legacy so you know Ooh. roddenberry's pitched the original series as Wagon Train to the Stars. I think you can pitch this as you haul to the stars. <laughs> I knew where you were going before you said it. Oh my God. You know, I mean, I think as a lesbian, I think we can all relate to, you know, still living with your ex and uh, working with them. That happens to all of us. <laughs> I don't think there's anything more lesbian, actually. <laughs> 
It's not a particularly romantic season, was it? Not no, for no. And, and, and even for Riker and Troy, it was, it was more a story about a, a family coming back together. Um, in, but in thank you for dealing with grief because grief in episode uh, season two was a little heavy, but the grief of losing a child I'm, I'm glad they addressed it because the way it was addressed in season one was sort of like, yeah, that, that was awful. Oh, well, yeah. uh, we left some coffee. And, and in season three, we actually see real human beings relating to one another about not communicating to each other the way that you have to. And I, I, mental health experts should watch season three and look at the mistakes and the successes of Counselor Troy. Boy, what a great Great that, that's my favorite i mean it is they they i mean i'm biased now but it is one of my favorite Riker choice scenes ever i think it's just it's because of breaks and marina yeah are just, so good in that moment so they amazing. really are just so comfortable with each other um um yeah i i i love them yeah, thank that, you that, that tremendously funny scene also where spiner you know a data leaves the session with deanna troy and <laughs> Right yeah. here. By the way, Brent Spiner's idea is that scene. So let me tell you what uh, you here's another one. Um, that scene was originally supposed to be Brent meets Soji. Oh, uh, and we we didn't have the time and the money to be able to pull that off. And we really needed to make it also a Marina scene as well to give her a final scene. And Brent was like, well, wouldn't I need therapy as the first? Scene? I'm like, holy fuck, Brent, that's the greatest scene idea ever. <laughs> um, and so we talked it through. Brent was so good with uh, with with ideas like this. And so, um, and it's a really terrific Brent Marina and Frake scene because you, their personalities really come through. And the yeah. idea that Data has just been abusing <laughs> the, the the he's been going over by hours and and, yes. and she's been trying all the time. Yes, just, yeah, and <laughs> just sitting there and being able to do it. And it's a, a, a you know. Yeah, and and then Riker asking him how he is, and he says, "I'm okay." You know, it's okay, just okay. And, and, yeah. and it also reminded me of the scene at the very end of Star Trek: Four Voyage Home, where uh, uh, Spock tells Sarek, "You know, tell Mother, I feel fine. I feel fine. I feel fine. You know, I feel so fine. Yeah, I love that as well. These two characters who had to deal with emotions. You know, yeah. Terry, I have this uh, airplane movie cut of Star Trek: Picard season three in which at some point you cut away to a bar in France and Laris is sitting at the bar saying, get me another, waiting for Picard. We sort of lost Laris. Yeah. And maybe we won't see her again. <laughs> tell, me about the, tell me about the writing though, because you have such great Star Trek bones from Enterprise to, point to all this Picard. Tell me where you came up with these amazing, incredible lines and how the writer's room and you cohesively I mean, that's really the essence of Star Trek, being able to be dramatic and also laugh at yourself at, at times. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's just what we do. <laughs> it's just a thing that we do, you know? It's just, it's... Uh, it's we are just, now a threesome. <laughs> do you hear yourself? Um, <laughs> you know, I think, you need, I, think that stu I think that stuff's important to break up the tension, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. And, and Riker and Worf have a great dynamic in this whole season. Um, I, I love Rafi and Worf. Everything with Worf. Michael Dorn. Uh, swords are fun. Um, I mean, <laughs> he's got some of the best lines in this whole season. And on top of that, you know, I also thought you have really hit home in terms of a lot of people who, when they saw Generations, said Troy crashed the saucer section and you gave her redemption in this episode. She saves them all. She saves them all. Yeah. Um, yeah, we had a joke in there. We cut it. It might be on the Blu-ray, um, but it, it didn't fit in where she goes. To, there's a, a little bit. But the moment in which it's her empathic abilities that finds them and, and goes. And then that shot was a, a shot that I, I, I had since kind of the inception of the whole idea of the whole thing. I really wanted a shot of Jack. Oh, looking up. Looking up at the Enterprise. And I didn't... And, weirdly production never fought me on it and i was like there's no way we're gonna pull this off there's no way and visual effects was like no we got it and i was like there's no way and then finally like as effects started coming in i was like holy shit we're gonna be able to do this 
<laughs> uh, and then I just saw it on the IMAX screen and, and, and I just, it's a movie moment and I'm really, really, really proud of it. And it's an emotional moment because it comes after Jack saying, no, I'm not alone. And it's the family coming to rescue them. And it, I'm, it's, a, it's a moment I'm really proud of. Yeah, there, there seems to be a theme throughout the entire season, actually, of, of, you know, the way that Picard convinces Jack to actually leave the board collective is not by convincing him. It's basically by giving up. It's by surrendering. It, by joining him. Yeah. Well, surrendering. It, it, like it, surrendering it, like Data did, right? It's surrendering, but it's it's also it's all, it's also love, right? It's love conquers all, and and it's the moment. Of, it's his most moment, moment of connection. The kid is longing for connection with with all these other entities that's out there, but it's the moment his father truly gives him the real thing um, that that uh, that sort of breaks him of the spell. Um, you know, it's 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 a simple idea, but it's from the heart. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like it's something that's you know even echoed at the very end where. When Picard wins the hand and and he says something about, you know, the stars basically has have his back. But at the at the same time, it's trusting in the universe to provide, trusting in your friends to to be there for you, trusting in the love you have for each other, that you'll be able to get through anything. And that's basically the, I think, the overarching theme of the of the season, you know, you know, from the beginning where we get this sort of separatist kind of, of theme, you know, sort of that mirrors what's going on in, in real life between, you know, our, our political systems where we can't trust each other to the very end where it's actually the trust of these folks, which saves the day. Yeah. I have three questions from fans that I promised I would ask you if I got the chance. First, was uh, Vatic smoking like a callback to the changeling in uh, uh, Star Trek VI uh, played by Iman? Uh, no. Okay. Second, You've been, I don't want to use the word accused. A fan, uh, some fans think that you give out too many spoilers as a showrunner, even before the show starts streaming. How do you respond to a, a statement like that, that you shouldn't give out spoilers or scenes or anything? I mean, I love everything you shared, and I don't think you've ever spoiled anything for me, but at least not without my permission. <laughs> but uh, Yeah, I would, have to, I would have to know specifically what I spoiled for them. Uh, they're just saying that you, you share things that they don't. I, I think there are some fans who don't want to see anything. They just want to see a poster and they don't, they think it's 1980 again. And it's not 1979 or 80. It is 2023 and the internet demands we see things. And I, I love it. I love seeing things. I, I, I would, I would never spoil anything. I wouldn't want a fan that I thought, of, that I thought would spoil the show. You know, thank I, you, Terry. I agree. I, I mean, I, 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 I'm beyond, if you knew how hard I fought to protect the Enterprise, D, uh, you know, um, you would. I have gray hairs on me. From, from, from I don't doubt that, it. You know, I don't. Doubt and, it. and a lot of fans actually said that you did a great job of keeping that a secret. That a lot. I of think so too. Went um, and and then the last question is: there are some who will um, criticize that we are at the Borg again. But if you think about the arc of Picard. It had to be the board. It had to be. Was there ever a time when you were writing season three where you thought, oh, maybe somebody else, some other villain? Or was it always the board for you? Uh, no, it was. So it was always the board. I, 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 so for me, it's with Kirk, it's always the Klingons. It's, you know, for Sherlock Holmes, it's always Moriarty. For Batman, it's always the Joker. I think in the final story, it always has to be that, that particular story. I, look, and I didn't hide it from you. The very first two <laughs> words said out loud in the season are the Borg, or literally are Patrick Stewart saying the Borg. Yes. Um, and I, look, I understand it because there is a fatigue. I think season two muddied the water with the Borg. Um, and I, I, I think, um, and that's understandable. Uh, I, there was, there's some um, expository stuff that we, we didn't probably clarify uh, as well at the end of that the things that got cut for for time um and and money uh to clarify that Gerardi was a different form of the Borg and she didn't rewrite history although I thought it was pretty clear that if she rewrote history Locutus and Wolf 359 couldn't happen but whatever um so uh but I so it is that itself is a fair criticism but at the same time 
Paw Wraiths? I mean, I, I'm not sure that was, you know, there's a Armist? red eye. It's really? The red went, eyes. Okay. You went with Armist? Um, I, I did. I did. I admit it. I did. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> look, it, it's, to it's totally fair. I think by the time you get to how and why, I feel like it's chilling enough to be different enough in the method. But look, maybe it's not your thing. I, it's fine. You don't have to like the season. <laughs> I, I mean, there's plenty of people who hate it. They still keep on watching. I know because they keep reviewing keep, and talking yes, about it. It's, yes. it's really weird. I don't watch the stuff I don't like, but people <laughs> love to, to do it. Yeah, hate watchers. I love so it. Weird. I, 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 who's got I time? Cheered. Who's time to hate watch? How do you people have the time to hate watch? <laughs> Terry, Terry, I jumped off the couch when Deanna brought the Enterprise D into the board ship, and you see it from underneath. I jumped off the couch. I cried my eyes out when. Picard hugged Jack and joined the collective and said, I'm so oh, I'm going to cry God. again now. Um, it was the most amazing, amazing thrill ride, roller coaster. Um, Maya, take it away while I wipe my tears. Yeah, I also, and I love the part where, uh, of course, uh, Beverly is able to basically use the weapons in the Enterprise D like an old pro because yeah. <laughs> and everyone Same. turns around and looks at A her. lot's happened in 20 years. A lot's happened in 20 years, yeah. <laughs> I, want, I mean, I wanted everybody to have a great moment at the end. There. That was a great moment. And also the unexpected great moment for the cook of the Titan who- <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ma'am, I'm just a cook, yeah. My dog ate my homework. I, I yeah, was absent this, that day. He's the Starfleet <laughs> Academy version of the dog ate my homework and I can't do the assignment, um, but I mean, he was able to pull through in the end too. Um, also, was the scene with um, the Enterprise D flying into the board queue, was that in any way an homage to Return of the Jedi with the Millennium Falcon? Um, it's, not, <laughs> it, it, it's, not, it's not an homage, but we're without question gonna get the, people are gonna compare it to it, right? Like anytime a ship goes into a big giant structure for the end of time, it, it will be compared to it. Uh, but no, not, not really. I mean, it wasn't like, let's do Return of the Jedi. It was like, why it would be really cool if the enterprise went in top, inside this cool structure and and data had to do it uh but yeah but some, you know, somebody gonna, mentioned gonna, it right somebody in the writer's room said isn't that just like return of the jedi didn't somebody well, bring well, it up well we're all gonna we all are like we'll do yeah but i mean <laughs> i get I, I guess there's there's two takes on it like if you say isn't it just like return of the jedi well then yeah you're <laughs> sure but or do you say wouldn't it be amazing to see the Enterprise inside this giant, cool Borg structure doing awesome things? So it just depends on your take. Like, yeah, you're going to get that that credit. Like, if you're out to hate it, Return of the Jedi. Right. <laughs> I mean, it is. Hate away. Hate away. It is. Hey, thank you. Thank you. No, on the, on the positive side, thank you for Anton Chekhov. A tribute to Anton Yelchin and bringing back an original serious those old scientists bringing back a tos actor walter koenig that dish was born and it was a callback too to star trek for the federation president almost an identical message i i very much wanted to do that for him yeah yeah and also a little bookend uh, when they're actually finally turning off the enterprise d and oh, they, yeah. they get into the turbo lift and um Picard tells Jordy to take care of her, and Jordy says, "You know, she's she's always taken care of us. You know, that's the least we can do." It actually reminded me of um, McCoy in yeah. the very first episode, of course. Yep. Of, she'll of always take you home. That's right. Yeah, that's you know, right. treat her like a lady, and she'll always take you home. And now we're at the end of the of the adventure, right? And these characters say, "We we took care of us. She she took care of us, and always brought us home." Yeah, and Major, yeah. Yep. And Major Barrett bringing back Majel Barrett, and you found clips. You didn't have to do AI. You actually found clips of Majel. Yeah, yep. There's going to be a question of it, and I know the answer is probably for drama, but when the <laughs> when the um, amplifier is destroyed, right, when the beacon is destroyed, mm -hmm. um, we get a, a cutaway where we hear the Borg voice in the fleet saying, you know, the transmission has been interrupted. Um, you know, continue on with the last order or something along those lines. And then, of course, the Borg cube explodes. And it is at that point that all the humans basically revert back from Borg to human. Um, I'm sure there's going to be questions from people saying, you know, why didn't they just turn back right away, you know, as soon as the beacon was destroyed? Well, Jordy says that the beacon is tied into the substructure of the cube. 
So it is it is the core of the amplification process, but the cube itself is amplifying. It's still amplifying the signal. So um, valid question. Cube still is very important and also for drones. Okay, yes. great. I also I also theorize that maybe because Jupiter is far away and it takes a while to get the signal. But you know also, also, also that. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Terry. Thank you for making our dreams come true. Thank you for this season. Thank you for oh, promising. Very, very that you're, I'm, 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 I know it's not a promise. I know it's only a dream. But Alex Kurtzman, Paramount people, CBS Studios, Viacom, hey, please, Star Trek Legacy. Put yeah. this man in charge. <laughs> Yeah. Give him a job. Give him a job. Yeah. Oh, I, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate we, that. We we got strange new worlds, you know, because of the because of the amazing performance of Captain Pike and in, in, in disco. So And the fans. Um, and and, and the fans. this is this is the first show to crack the, the top ten in the streaming Nielsen's, right? Yes. Uh, Congratulations, cool. Terry. Yeah. So. Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what it means, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> it means it's popular and people are watching, and you deserve a big pat on the back, Paramount. Yeah. <laughs> kudos to you i mean it as somebody who was uh, a teenager when star trek next generation next generation came out this has been a dream come true in a lot of different ways it's been all the cool things that we wish we could have seen uh, well i'm glad you guys liked it it really means a lot live long and prosper terry thank you oh, thank you <laughs> hi terry what a thrill to get to talk to terry again and for you to get to talk to him for the first time mm -hmm. I, I, i'm just over the moon maya I am as well. He also followed me on Twitter, which makes me feel like a very special person. <laughs> well, you are a special person. You are a special person. So let me conclude by saying live long and prosper. And right. um, I'll see you on the interwebs. Yes, see you on the interwebs.